Hi everybody, I'm Minerva Urbina Rincón and welcome to this presentation on Pozolo de Trigo in conjunction with Border Community Alliance based out of Tubac, Arizona. I'm coming to you from Tempe, Arizona from my kitchen and so we're going to break um, Pozolo de Trigo. So I'm going to start. I already have a pot going right here with some water and also some beef bones. So the beef bones have been cooking for a little bit. Okay. If you are not familiar with pozole de trigo, it is one of those dishes that is characteristic of the state of Sonora in northern Mexico. Sonora, right underneath of Arizona. But uh, not characteristic of the entire state, where there are some areas where it is a lot more common to find it than in not. I grew up in Hermosillo, the capital of Sonora, where it's actually not a very common dish, or at least not in my particular area of where I grew up. But in the Rio Sonora, uh, Sonora area, in the valleys from there, uh, it's quite common. And then also in Magdalena de Quino, about 60 miles south of the U.S. Nogales, um, U.S.-Mexico border. But, uh, so it's particular to those regions because those are wheat growing regions and wheat uh, in the state of Arizona and Sonora, um, sort of in the southwest of the U.S. in the northwest of Mexico, is grown in the winter. Okay? It grows over the winter and it's particularly well suited to this terrain because of it being relatively mild winters and relatively dry. Okay? But right around this date, uh, nearing May 15th, and we'll talk about the significance of that date later, uh, would be when this particular dish would be made, which is uh, coincides with the wheat harvest. So it would be made with recently harvested wheat. But it's a beef-based soup uh, with the wheat berries, wheat berries like the ones I have here, okay? But it's also heavy in vegetables, but we're gonna start with the base of it here. So like I said, Beef bones, uh, soup bones in here, in the water. I'm going to add more beef to it. So right now, beef short rib, short rib pieces. I'm gonna add some short rib, some more short rib bone in, okay? And some little stew meat pieces. And I'm also adding a little bit of pork. Sonora, the state of Sonora, uh, as you may know, is a beef producing in a state, okay? So traditionally made with all beef, but not always. This is one of these, uh, one of those dishes that is actually very difficult to pin down a specific recipe, okay? I'm gonna wash my hands and I'll be right back with you. So difficult to pin down a specific recipe because of the fact that it is a community driven dish. It's a dish that is made at the time of harvest of the wheat and you're celebrating the harvest of the wheat with the soup. Uh, and that day, the May 15th day, uh, coincides with the Catholic Saint patronage of um, San Isidro. So it's the day of San Isidro el Labrador, the laborer. But the laborer is not really the correct name for it because uh, San Isidro, uh, who's a real man, uh, 10th, 11th century, born uh, right near Madrid in Spain, uh, in Madrid. And he was a farm worker, uh, poor of, uh, of birth, and, but very charitable in his work. So the day was, uh, you know, he was canonized, the day was named after him. And um, I don't, my set of knowledge does not let me know if he was a wheat farmer or what kind of farmer he was. Um, I just know he was a very charitable individual. And so he is the patron saint of not only Madrid, the city of his birth, but also of farm workers, farm laborers. So on this day, on the 15th of May, the community comes together to celebrate the harvest because celebrating, you know, the harvest itself takes a great deal of people, takes the entire community to bring in and clean in uh, and clean all the wheat. Uh, if you are into period pieces, period films, there's a really, really great uh, film uh, miniseries adaptation of um, Anna Karenina that was aired on Masterpiece a few years ago. A correct year fails me. But there's a really fantastic uh, wheat harvest or grain harvest scene in there where um, the one of the rich counts um, goes to go work with the people. And of course, all the, you know, the peasants are making fun of this rich guy trying to hang in there with how much work it is to harvest wheat. So 
a lot of labor, not only because everything has to be cut from the field and brought in, but everything has to be cleaned from the shed. So this soup is, uh, you know, made to celebrate the harvest and the community effort to celebrate the harvest. So community-based soup, which means that each one of these um, groups doing their own their soup to celebrate this harvest is going to have their own recipe. So if you look at some of the recipes, you'll find a huge variety of ingredients going in there. Traditionally, it is made with um, oxtail, with uh, you know the tailbone of a cow. Unfortunately right now because of current uh, global situation, uh, oxtail is a little bit harder to come by. So I was able to find uh, soup bones, okay, and the short ribs. Short ribs are very common in Mexican soups, traditionally, especially in northern Mexican soups. So uh, of course it wasn't until a few years ago where all of a sudden short ribs became really, really expensive and so had to change to different kind of cuts. If you can't find short ribs or oxtail, you know, do like I did, get a um, some soup bones. And um, oxtail, in particular, not to everybody's uh, taste. I love it, but it, it can have a little, lot of, um, you know, little sil really thick silver skin on it. So not to everybody's taste, but you know, at least try it once because it does it is does make a fantastic soup base. But back to the composition of the soup itself. You find all sorts of different recipes to it. Um, so it's a very easy to adjust recipe depending on what it is you have on hand because that's how it's supposed to be made. It's everyone that can contribute a little bit to the soup pot. It's sort of like a, the Mexican version um, of Chipino. Chipino is from you know Italian Americans of everybody brings their own little thing or you know in Italy as well everybody provides their own little addition to those to the seafood stew. Well here everybody brings a vegetable that they have um, on hand. So some of the things that are normally found are um, camotes, sweet potatoes, um, green beans, ejotes, which would be right. Um, you'd have some of that first few crops, or the last few crops actually, since uh, things like green beans and such grow here in this uh, Sonoran Desert region uh, over the winter, so alongside of the, uh, the wheat. Uh, camotes, you know, sweet potatoes, they grow throughout the summer and fall, and you still might have some, you know, from the previous harvest. Um, so things that are available in that time. Uh, some of the first soft squashes, so Mexican gray squash, or sometimes also um, chayote, uh, the harder squash. Um, so those kinds of additions, um, some people add nopales, prickly pear paddles, uh, corn, in a cut into coins, usually you also find carrots, uh, things like that. So it's very easy to customize to your flavor. I like adding um, repollo, uh, green cabbage, to soups. So I have some available, so I'm going to add that. But at this point, now that my beef and my pork are cooking, they're going to have to cook for a little while before I can add my wheat. Otherwise, my wheat would be way too soft by the time my meat is ready. So the soup bones have been cooking already for about 45 minutes. I'm going to let the soup um, come back to a simmer and cook for about an hour or so before I add the wheat grains, the wheat berries, okay? And we'll talk about the wheat berries a little bit more. If you feel, if you hear some squeaking in the background, that will be my child over here and then my little baby chicks behind you, okay? And don't worry, they're both completely harmless. So we'll be back in about an hour. Thanks. Uh, if you are familiar with the Sonoran Desert in general, you'll know that it's very, very hot, very dry here in the summertime. And we have that fifth season of the monsoons in the summer, but our winters are also very, very nice and mild. Uh, not a lot of precipita precipitation in the winter, so that means that it's particularly well suited to growing wheat during the winter time when it might be slightly too cold for corn to grow properly, but it doesn't particularly bother wheat. And it's that dry uh, growing season that is required for wheat because otherwise it's a little, it's very sustainable or very perceptible to growing uh, fungus on it. And that particular fungus is very, very damaging to anyone consuming it. it can lead to hallucinations, uh, madness, and of course eventual death. But 
this wheat, this new crop that could be grown very, very well in the winter was very important not only to the sustainability of the mission system um, led by the Jesuits for a long time, uh, who were responsible for introducing so many agricultural products that are known, um, uh, that are grow, grow very well in this region, like apricots, um, uh, pomegranates, figs, uh, or mission grapes, etc. Uh, quince as well, but um, the wheat as well. So it was important for them because missions had to be self-sustaining, but it was also important to the tribes of this area, to the pre-Columbian people of the area who now had another staple crop to add to their diet to kind of bridge that, gra that gap between um, the summer corn, the last of the squash, and then adding in also the wheat. So adding another grain to the diet. Um, so the grain became just as important as the corn had been before. Corn in the Sonoran region doesn't have the ancient history that it does in other parts of Mexico. Other parts in Southern, uh, Southern Mexico, uh, Central America, Corn has a 6,000 year history. In this region, it goes back maybe about 1,500 years. So it doesn't have as ancient of a tradition, which is um, not only is it because less historically ingrained, but also the environmental suitability of growing wheat in this region where it's not as wet. It is mountainous, but not as heavily mountainous as um, central, southern uh, parts of Mexico. So um, it took hold here a little bit better than it did elsewhere, which is why it was so well integrated into the diet and why this particular soup um, is so representative of some parts of Sonora. So now that the wheat berries um, are in the pot and it's simmering away happily, I'm gonna let them cook for about an hour, uh, 45 minutes to an hour. I'm never really too specific on time. I just go more of what the smell of the soup um, is telling me. But we're gonna come back and then we're going to start adding our produce, a variety of produce into the pot. Tell by the lighting change, it's been quite a bit of time since we added the wheat berries. It's been about an hour and a half. And so that's why it's really important to take a look at or think about cooking, not on a basis of time, but on a basis of what it is you're cooking. Uh, the boneless meat was actually getting to a point where it was mostly tender, but the short ribs needed a little bit more time. If you're going to use something like the oxtail, oxtail does take longer to get to that softer stage uh, because it's got so much of that uh, silver skin right around covering the whole thing. So it takes a little bit longer to break down. So if you're going to, you know, the short ribs have been cooking for about two and a half hours. If you're going to use an oxtail, you're going to want to put your oxtail in first. Cook it for maybe one or one and a half, even two hours if you want to make sure that everything is nice and soft before you start adding your boneless meat or um, any other meat with bones. So ideally, tougher things go in first, softer things go in later, which is the same rule that applies when it comes to adding our vegetables. We're going to start adding the vegetables now. I have my cutting board right here. So uh, what I'm doing today, as far as vegetables, and like I talked about, this is a community-driven um, driven dish. So uh, different communities, different families, different farms are going to have different things that they put in there. And it might change from one season to another, depending on what's available. But you start with tougher things first, and then move on to softer things at the end. I have sweet potato, and I have chayote. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the calabacitas, the gray Mexican squash that was uh, available, wasn't very nice. So I'd rather substitute with something like chayote. Chayote actually cooks beautifully in, so in soups because it retains its, uh, its shape, but it absorbs flavor, flavor beautifully. So if you're not familiar with it, it comes in the smooth like this and spineless variety. And it's got a seed in there, so we'll take a look at that here when I cut it. But we're going to add chayote, chayote and the sweet potato camote at the same time. So for the chayote, I'm gonna stand it up like this, cut it down the middle. And then you can see that seed right there, that core. So I'm gonna cut it in half again into quarters, and I'm gonna core that out as if it were a pear. 
and I'm going to cut it in nice big wedges like this and then maybe just cut it a little bit more. So sort of bite sized pieces, okay? So ayote is going to go in first along with that sweet potato. Sweet potato and chayote going in at the same time. And so that soup pot is going to get really pretty full towards the end of our soup, which is precisely what we want. We want nice big full of full bowls for everyone that's been working on the wheat harvest. I will be adding a little bit more salt to the pot in a little bit. So our camote sweet potato we're going to cut into about one inch slices. One inch slices. We're not peeling this. I washed these earlier. That skin is going to have a lot of the nutrients and a lot of the flavor. So those are going to go into the pot. I'm going to poke them down here in a little bit so that everything cooks nice and evenly. Mm, this one, I'm going to cut it in half. So consistency in size becomes very important when you're doing something like this. You want to make sure that everything is going to cook evenly. But that's also why it's really, really important to follow that system of softer things are going to go in last. My green beans are going to be the last thing that I add, okay? Because we don't want them to become absolute mush. If I were to add them at the very beginning of when I'm adding vegetables, by the end of it, I wouldn't want to eat those green beans, okay? So make sure you think about how dense something is before you add it into that soup pot. Okay, so I'm going to add these in here. Give it a little bit of a swirl. And going to add a good pinch of salt, just a little bit more. You'll notice that at no point in time I have I added black pepper into the pot. Okay, there's a lot of uh, newer Mexican recipes where you will see the use of black pepper. If you look at older Mexican recipes, um, even right past, uh, right after the colonial time into perhaps um, early 20th century, black pepper almost never comes in. When it comes to black pepper, the story I like to tell people is uh, when I ask my mom of how she likes to make her pozole. And my mom's... Uh, absolutely loves black pepper. She can just take a little peppercorn and just munch at it, you know, like a squirrel eating it, uh, even though it makes her tongue go numb. But, um, you know, so I asked her, we went through all the ingredients and I'm like, but there's no pepper in the recipe. She's like, well, no, it doesn't use black pepper. And I was like, well, why not? You put pepper on everything. And very seriously, she just told me, well, you just don't. And I was like, okay, got it, you know? So, Black pepper, not something that's uh, used all the time. And when you have all these flavors of all these different vegetables, um, when you have that flavor of the uh, really fantastic sort of mineral rich uh, Sonoran desert grown beef, you're not going to miss the black pepper. So put it away on this recipe uh, and just enjoy the other flavors you have in the pot. So we're going to let these cook for about 10 minutes, uh, maybe less, and then I'm going to go ahead and start adding in. So I have my carrots cut already for the soup. So I'm gonna go ahead and, because those are a tougher vegetable, uh, and this is my personal preference. For a lot of people, they probably would have added them in at the same time as the chayote and as the sweet potato, the camote. For me, if I'm putting carrots into something, I want them to still have that bite. Okay, so that's why I waited a little bit. It's been about 10 minutes why I'm adding the carrots now. If you wanted to add them sooner, totally understand personal preference. Honestly, personal preference, I might not even put carrots in there because I don't like carrots in soup. I love carrots otherwise, just not in soup. Other things, I'm gonna cover this back up so it comes back to the summer. Other things we're gonna add. And again, everything changes depending on what you have. Okay, we're gonna talk about what's in this little bundle here in a little bit. But 
We're also going to add some repollo, so green cabbage. I'm gonna cut this. You can see a little bit of the core right here. I'm gonna cut around it just a bit. And don't worry, we're still gonna use this. Okay, we're not gonna add a lot of um, the cabbage, but just a bit. It's again, everything that we're adding here is just a little bit, except for that beef, that meat, <laughs> the wheat berries, that's the main component. The vegetables is a little bit of everything. I added two carrots, it was a two chayote, uh, and two of the sweet potatoes, the camote. The repollo, the cabbage, I'm adding, you know, it's like just half of a small cabbage, so it's not even that big of a cabbage. So just a bit. Cabbage, even though it's a fairly soft uh, vegetable, actually can stand up to a little bit more cooking time. So I'm breaking them up a little bit here. I'm gonna break this up a bit more. And this is also gonna go into the pot. And, um, you know, cabbage and members of the brassica family. So cabbage, kale, broccoli, kohlrabi, uh, Brussels sprouts, all of those things. Those are actually um, better for you, more digestible when they are cooked rather than raw okay it's easier for human beings to absorb the nutrients in them otherwise really it's just you're just processing fiber unless you have the digestive system of a goat which i frequently uh, wish that i did but unfortunately i was not blessed with such a system so next thing we're going to do i'm going to clean my cutting board here but next thing we're going to do is i'm going to get my green beans and my purslane we'll talk about that in a second first i'm going to dress my bean and my chiles so unfortunately like i said this is a community community based uh dish my personal community did not have any uh, chile verde, any Anaheim peppers. Although I'm Northern Mexican, so I should pronounce chile verde how it needs to be pronounced by a Northern Mexican proper, which is chile verde. A uh, little bit even faster, chile verde, like that. But I did have some poblano peppers growing in one of my plants. My chile verde plants right now are taking a break. They did beautifully over the winter and everything that I uh, harvested from them, I actually left on the plant until it was red and started to dry out. So I have some that are uh, some sartas, which is what we call them in Sonora. It's, uh, Ristra is more uh, New Mexico. Sarta is what they're called in Sonora. It's those long strands of chilies drying out. So I toasted these uh, tatemados, not tamitados, tatemados, uh, slightly and sweated them out in a towel so they're still a little warm so i'm just cleaning them with a towel to get that skin off so because i will share this soup with a small child i'm actually not going to add these to a to the soup pot normally they'd be added cut into strips we will get to that point they'd be cut into strips and added to the pot but because my four-year-old doesn't really have quite the heat tolerance level and my chili peppers have been coming out particularly spicy because I apparently starve my plants of water. So my peppers come out kind of hot. So we're gonna add these at the very end. Okay, I'm gonna show you how we're going to clean them. As far as cleaning them, we're going to take off that seed. And these I actually toasted uh, directly on some mesquite charcoal that I have going on on my grid, uh, my grill outside, I'm smoking um, some pork butt. This is not a normal concurrence for me, but because I have the time right now, might as well get some fun things going. So I cleaned out the seeds, most of them anyway, and you can do it with your hands, you can do it with a paring knife, I'm just doing it with my hands. I'm just getting rid of that rib on the inside. Obviously, don't rub your face right after this, but otherwise, we're just gonna cut this into long strips. But like I said, for me, these are going to be more garnish. Otherwise, you'd be adding these in the last you know, five minutes of cooking the soup. So I'm continuing to clean my peppers and getting rid of those seeds like I did earlier. Okay, don't do that at home. And I'm gonna finish cleaning these. I'm gonna get to the rest of these a little bit later. We'll talk about the green beans next. 
So green beans are going to be one of the last things that they are going to go in. So green beans, I'm just trimming very easily on both sides. Okay. You can choose to cut them in half. That's going to make it a little bit easier for them to go into the pot and to be able to plate it out, be plated out. Okay. So we're just trimming on both sides. These are tender, so they're not going to need that much time. If you don't have green beans available, that's fine. Just substitute with something else. But before I finish cleaning the rest of these green beans, okay, we're going to talk about verdolaga, the thing that I have in here in this little jar of water. So these are actually store-bought. Throughout the summer, I usually get quite a bit of this growing wild. It goes by a variety of names in Spanish, usually verdolaga. Sometimes it kind of falls under the category of quelites, which are like wild greens. Uh, but you ideally want the nice little green, tender, young leaves and the tender shoots. I'm going to drop these in water. So the ones from the grocery store are usually not as good as the ones you buy, you have growing wild in your yard. So if you find these in your yard, uh, don't try to transplant them with the root. You're going to transplant them just it's a succulent. So you're going to transplant them like you do most other or grow another plant like you do a lot of other succulents. You take a bit of a, you know, stem uh, stem and leaves and just stick them in damp soil and they will grow from there. I've tried to transplant them otherwise they just don't work. They die in the process. So I'm dipping these into coal, into water right here to make sure I clean them and also sometimes they have a lot of little black seeds still stuck to them. So to get those seeds out I'm going to finish cleaning the verdolaga, I'm going to finish cleaning the green beans, and those are going to be the last thing to go in. I've tasted my soup as far as seasoning. Remember that seasoning in this instance, I'm only talking about salt. I'm not talking about salt and pepper. That's actually the most, for the most part, when I talk about seasoning. It's only salt. Salt is a seasoning. Spi uh, pepper is a spice. Seasoning enhances flavor, so that's salt. Spice is going to change the flavor. That's your pepper. Okay, so we are going to clean this off, finish this off. I'm going to add everything to the pot in a little bit. So we are at the finish of our soup. Um, total elapsed time has probably been around um, four hours. Most of it has really just been add something to the pot, walk away, you know, go have a snack, play, etc., come back add something else. So not a lot of active cooking time, delicious result. Okay, so we are at the last bits that we are adding. And I actually tasted the poblanos. They're not that spicy, so I'm going to go ahead and add these. I'm going to add the green beans, add the green beans, add the roasted chilies, whether you're using chile verde or poblanos, whatever you have on hand. I'm going to smush this down. Okay, and the other, the last thing I'm going to add is going to be my verdolaga. Not a lot that was good that came out of it. If you can, if you find it growing at home, absolutely foster that. Get it to grow. It will do beautifully even in the hot heat of the Sonoran Desert. In the summertime, I'll get some bushes that are literally this big. I'll go and harvest from them every other day. Okay. Uh, they're fantastic with scrambled eggs in the morning. So I'm going to let this cook for just a little bit longer. I'm going to bring the phone over here in just a second so you guys can see what the pot looks like. And we're actually going to get back to this tomorrow morning because like everybody else working at home right now, it's dinner time and uh, I've got chickens and a child and a husband to feed. So we'll take a look at the soup later on, but otherwise I'm going to bring the video over here. So that's the soup right there. It's going to take a couple more minutes before it's finished. I'm going to get let those green beans and that verdolaga sit. They're going to soften up just enough, but not so much that they become gray and dull and lifeless. And that so it's the next day from making pozole de trigo, uh, also sometimes known as pozole de milpa, a milpa being a, uh, a farm. Um, 
and uh, I'm definitely one of those people that think soups are much better the next day than they are the day they're being made and actually whenever I do make pozole of any kind I always make it the day before I want to consume it just because it's so much more enjoyable that way it's all the flavors kind of meld together so I have a small bowl of this very very hearty soup in front of me but um, more importantly I also have one of the other sort of essential features of Sonoran cuisine not to um, say that it is a Sonoran only ingredient because it's not um, a lot of you will probably be familiar with this this tiny little red round chili definitely worth its weight in gold Chiltepin. It's one of the most expensive spices in the world after saffron because these are hand cultivated in the wild. They are sold that are commercially grown as well. They don't really have quite the same flavor, but they grow as far north as Tubac, Arizona uh, into Texas and then all the way down actually to northern Colombia and the Caribbean. So it's also known as bird chili because birds absolutely do love these uh, once they're nice and red and ripe. Last year, my um, tiny little chilipin bush managed to have one, and of course a bird ate it before I was able to harvest it, so I'm going to be smarter about it this year. But uh, this is one of those uh, features that you find in Sonoran tables quite a bit, as well as one of these, uh, chilipinero, chilipin crusher, carved out of ironwood, where you first, you know, you want to make sure that there's nothing in there. Sometimes people will leave something behind. And I'm being a little brave today, putting in two. Uh, and then you're going to crush, crush, crush. And dump out into your soup. So it's something that you'll find in a lot of Sonoran households, uh, throughout some restaurants, uh, things like that, especially when you're in the Sonoran River, River Valley, where this is dish is going to be, uh, this dish is going to be found a little bit more. And um, so I very much enjoyed the process of making this. Let's just go over the process of making the dish um, so we can clarify things, Any anything I may have breezed through quickly in the actual video. Uh, because I was starting out with soup bones rather than an oxtail uh, and the heaviness of the soup bones, I started those out before adding anything else. So in the water for about an hour, hour and a half before I added any of the meat. If you were to be using an oxtail, they do take a little bit of while of cooking at a nice slow simmer uh, for that film on the outside of the oxtail to start breaking up. So start your oxtail in a lot of water as you can so as you can tell in the soup bowl itself, you know, you don't have a really great look of it, but um, there's not a tons of broth in the soup. This is much more of a that vegetable and the grain heavy, uh, and that's really not a huge amount of meat in comparison to the amount of uh, vegetables and grain in it. And so it's really the, the beef is going to provide the base, the base of the flavor, but you do want to make sure you have a good quantity of water in the pot, uh, far more water than you initially think you're going to need for the quantity of the meat. So oxtail, if you're using it, will need to cook for quite a bit longer. Uh, I would recommend two hours before you add any other meat so it starts to soften really, really nicely already at that point. Uh, boneless meat, a boneless stew meat, I would still cook for about two, two and a half hours. The wheat berries need about one hour uh, to cook nice and softly and it's a nice steady simmer. Okay, I don't bring anything in my pot into a boil before I uh, reduce it to a simmer. I just let it come up to a simmer and keep it there, adjust the heat as necessary. Uh, I don't know if anybody noticed in the video I was using an enamel cast iron pot which is going to retain heat really nicely and it's going to keep that temperature nice and steady. Uh, let's see, the garlic is added as the whole bulb um, just cut in half and the garlics will just kind of loosen up from the paper. You can take the time to clean the cloves and mince them if you would like, but it's completely unnecessary. It's just traditionally, it's just not the way that it's done in this dish. Um, and you know, everybody likes to follow tradition, right? So um, just be lazy about your garlic, just throw it in there. Uh, I didn't throw in a lot of aromatics in this dish. Um, pozole, like the traditional uh, corn pozole, I do throw in 
uh, Mexican oregano, just sort of like a big handful of it. Uh, in this one, not so much. This one, because it's much more of a vegetable soup, uh, the vegetables themselves are going to be the aromatics uh, in them. But um, bay leaf is fine if you want to use it. Um, traditionally, not used in the recipe. But because there is such a wide range of how this recipe is cooked from one group, uh, one town, one family to another, um, I've seen lots of different ways of making it with onion, uh, with cilantro going in there, um, with more chilies going in there. Uh, so it's up to the personal taste on if you want to add cilantro to it or not. Uh, as much as I love cilantro and the flavor of it, I am a big proponent of getting people to know about Mexican cooking that does not have cilantro in it because not everything does. But otherwise, um, what I've said earlier in the video of making sure you add things from tougher to softer uh, in that order as you go along when it comes to vegetables, no matter what vegetables you are using, that is very, very important so that you don't end up with vegetables that are completely overcooked. And what's your salt? Just a little bit of salt in the beginning of the meat cooking process just to help give that meat a little bit of flavor, but not so much salt that you can actually taste it and that would keep the, uh, the wheat grain from softening. Once the wheat is softened, you can uh, season the soup properly, uh, add a bit more salt, but just remember that as you are adding vegetables, you may need to recheck and add just a little bit more salt. Uh, I will readily admit that by the time I finished adding the vegetables yesterday, I needed to add more salt than from what I had originally uh, added. So make sure you check for seasoning and adjust from there. And I very much look forward to that question and answer uh, session. For if you um, have any questions, just make sure you write those down and ask me on um, on that date. So. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, having patience with me. And thank you for your support at um, Border Community Alliance. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing another one of these events in the future. Thank you very much.